put our hands together.
worship Him, church. Just raise up your hands and worship God.
Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blood. I was rich. I remember who I was. I was blind. I was lost. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The bridge was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you have held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I have known Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me wide
was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory International Church. 
Let's just pray before we go to God's Word. Father, we give you all praise, all glory. We bow our hearts to you and we acknowledge your Lordship. We acknowledge that you are the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and that you are the one that made us and that you are the one that sustains us. And so, Lord, we look to you, O oh God, as we walk through this life, as we serve, as we do all that you've, you've called us to do. Lord, we pray that your name will be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the hero, hero, heroes of faith. In verse 23, it reads, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he be came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to his reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And so here, in a very uh, encapsulated, brief way, they have de described the uh, pilgrimage of faith. Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And um, in that story, we see a lot of principles that would apply to our own lives. That each one of us, when we come to know the Lord as our Savior, that we begin a pilgrimage that will take us through three stages as um, Moses had three movements from Egypt to the, the Promised Land. The first stage being deliverance, the second stage development, and then, of course, destiny in the promised land. And of course, that portion was uh, taken over by Joshua. He continued that part of the promise. And you can also break it up and describe it, um, the pilgrimage of faith into three movements in our life, the leaving, the living, and the looking. And we want to break it up into those three. Um, deep down in our hearts, we I believe a life that the life of faith is restricted to a few special people, but I want to suggest to us that it's not just for Moses or for Abraham's, it's for all of us. That God wants us to live a life of faith, and so it would include these three different sections in our life. The first section being leaving. You know, you've got to leave to be able to cleave to God. Uh, you know, I always teach... Uh, Couples who are getting married, that you have to leave your family so that you can cleave to your new family. Um, and in many sense, it's a physical leaving of your um, uh, parents' homes and then starting your own home and your own family. And likewise, when God calls us out of Egypt, out of sin, out of our former lives, He takes us into a new adventure, into our new lives. Uh, behold, all things are made new, the Bible says. So you can't get to the promised land until you leave Egypt. And for some, they might think, what's the big deal about leaving Egypt? Egypt, after all, is a land of slavery. It has nothing to promise. It's just pain. It's just slavery. It's just, it's just hopelessness. But you know, it took a lot for the Israelites to leave Israel. So likewise, in, uh, to leave Egypt, rather. Um, I mean, for, for many of us, we might think, well, you know, of course, you know, uh, if God promises, pros, promises me something better, I will drop everything and go. It's not as easy as we think. Leaving is not the easiest thing in the world. And I, I, I have experienced it in my own way, in different aspects, Le leaving my homeland, my birth land, leaving my family, uh, my church. Uh, leaving can be the hardest part of the pilgrimage of faith, the hardest part of the journey. Leaving is hard because that's your security. Even though your security might be like, for the Israelites, slavery. Strange as it may seem. It's your identity. It's your perceived future. It's, it's what you were used to. 
even though what you were used to may not be the best thing in the world. So sometimes it can be hard. And uh, leaving involves taking your family along with you. And I believe that as a Christian, especially if you are married and have children, you, you are on this pilgrimage of faith and you are meant to bring your family along with you. You're not supposed to just go out on your own and do your own thing. And that's why it's important that you find a spouse that is of like faith, you know, that, be, that walks with the Lord, that you raise your children to do the same. Until they leave and they cleave and start their own family, they, when they live under your, your, your roof and your household, uh, you bring them along on their journey. You take them on your journey of faith. So it can be the hardest part of the journey, but it's the most important part of the journey to step out. And leaving is essential if you want to be a learner of spiritual truths. If you want to grow, if you want to pick up from the Lord some of these other faith lessons, you can't sit back and do nothing. You've got to step out and trust God that He will guide you, He'll protect you. When God calls there, there are no guarantees about tomorrow. That's for sure. That's why it's called the life of faith, right? He doesn't guarantee us that there will be no problems. He guarantees us that He will take us through those problems, that we will grow through them. So, leaving family, you know, uh, security, uh, and, and in, in many cases, uh, for, for many of us, we are not born in a Christian family. Our parents uh, were not Christians, and, and, and uh, so when you're born again, you have to leave the faith, the, the religion, uh, and that can be uh, pro problematic. It can be cultural baggage that needs to be shared before God can use you. Because, you know, we carry a lot of this baggage in our lives that we don't realize that many of those things in our lives, whether our belief system, our thought processes, our philosophy, may not be biblical. It may be anti-biblical and, and it may go against the, the promises of God and it may hold us back and be an uh, obstacle to what God wants to do. It can be generational curses that need to be broken before God can bless you, can use you. And that's where, you know, when we're singing that song, the last few weeks, um, you know, made room when, when we came to the, the um, bridge. It says, shake up the ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. And that's, neat. that's what we need to do is to, to, to literally shake off all these chains, all this stuff that holds us to our past that is not of God so that we can move into the present moment and into the future where God wants us to be. So you have to leave your own ideas, your own plans, your own desires, your own dreams even, if you want your God-given destiny. I mean, I, I gave up a lot. And, 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 you know, just never looked back. Not because I hated it, I loved it too much, you know, and I realized that, that if I keep looking back, I will never move forward. And so, you know, and, and God has not let me down. I mean, it's been, it's been such a, a wonderful, amazing journey of faith. Um, so there was no leaving without deliverance for Moses and Israel. The first part, the deliverance, the first part, the le leaving. Many are stuck in the past, can move into uh, God's blessed plans for their lives. And so you need to sometimes, you know, uh, have external assist, uh, assistance like Moses going in and God undertaking to break that bondage, to break you out from the past. And you've got to break free before you can live free. You've got to break free before you can have a breakthrough in your life. And so, you know, God is here and He wants to give you a breakthrough this week in your life so that you can move into God's plan, promises. So leaving is essential if you want to be a practitioner, not just a learner, a practitioner of spiritual truth. Um, you know, for a part of growing up, uh, in, in my own experiences, so long as I live under my, my parents' roof, my mom always treats me as, a, you know, as, as her son, as a little boy. You know, everything, you have to go through them, and, and um, you know, she'll tell you, oh, no, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't that, do, do that. And her faith is not my faith, her calling is not my calling. And that's where when it was time for me, I had to break free and, um, so that I can begin to practice some of those spiritual truths apply it in my own family, step out in faith, and trust God. You know, uh, my parents raised me so well, taught me so many things. But you know what? When I stepped out and trusted God, I learned so much more spiritual truth from God, you know, that if I had not stepped out, I would have 
you know, be, be limited in what I, I, I could do. So there are a number of things that we need to leave, and the first thing is to leave unbelief. All of us, you know, we carry a baggage of unbelief because we were raised in a, if I can see it, then I can believe it. If I can touch it, then I can taste it. If I don't see it, if I cannot touch it, I cannot believe it. So it's tough when it comes to spiritual things because much of spiritual truth is invisible. Much of spiritual power is in a different realm than this material world. So you're going to drop and leave unbelief. Um, and of course, uh, you know, with Gideon, one of the heroes of faith in Judges 6, he basically looked at himself when God said, you, you know, God's going to use you, your mighty man of faith. And, and he looked and he says, oh Lord, how can I save Israel? He said, my family, my clan is the weakest. I'm the least in my father's house. You know, there's no way I can do it. That's that unbelief, born out of being raised as the youngest child in a different setting. So he's looking at his circumstances. He's looking at his small worldview and he's saying, this is who I am, this is what I've done, I cannot do that. And so you've got to shed unbelief to step up. Step up to the next level, the next realm of, of, of blessings, of, of power, of anointing, of calling. Gideon had to break down his family idols. That's where God told him in the night, you know, I know you're not born up to do in the day, so do in the night, go and break the family idols so that he can begin to flow in the power of God. What does the family idols represent? The past, bondage, small thinking, because he kept looking back, oh, my family, my family is the smallest, I'm the smallest. And God says, no, 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 no. That's an idol in your life. That's a bondage in your life. I'm going to break it because when I break it, then you can begin to practice and step out in faith. And then you can begin to look at your Father in heaven that is greater than everything that surrounds you in this life. So leave unbelief. Leave negativity. You've got to banish your old familiar defeatist attitude. I don't know, you know, um, I praise God that, that you know, um, many uh, folks may be positive, but in every uh, one of our upbringing, at some point in our life, there is that bit of negativity. Oh yeah, you know you can do this, but you're not good at that. Uh, you know, and, and even in the way that, that, we're, uh, that the world treats us, we are put down uh, by friends, by school, and so you, you have this negative attitude in many different areas that have been put on us or we grew up with that. And you've got to banish that. And then, of course, you've got to leave and uh, you've got to leave uh, the, an unrenewed mindset. You know, before we come to the Lord, our mind is unrenewed. Our mind is programmed by the world. That's what it means by unrenewed. It's programmed by your, your, your parents. And no matter how good they are, it is not, you know, uh, the Bible. It is not uh, God's programming. And then, of course, the school programming, societal programming, your peers. And so our mindset is limited. Our mindset is bound by the here and now. So you've got to leave your small mindset and step out in faith and say, well, you know, I want to go beyond what I can think or see or what I think I can do. Because God says, you know, I'm going to give you something that you're going to do, you're going to see, you're going to be able to, to imagine things that, are far beyond what is currently within your realm. And so we need that renewed mind. Romans 12 tells us we need to have our minds renewed. And then leaving represents a new life. It represents a new life. I mean, for me, uh, it's been, ever since I was 18, it's been like every so many years, I have a new life, a new experience. The first step to leave and go into the military was shocking. You leave the comfort of home where mom serves you, where, you know, everything is, is nice and comfortable, and then you go to the military and everybody's shouting at you, and everything is changed, and, and everything is harsh, it's so disciplined, and, and there's, there isn't that security. Anything could go wrong because of the danger element. It's that new life. And then when I finish... Immediately the day after I left the military, I was off to Taiwan where I didn't know a soul there. I didn't know the system. The language was so tough to handle, although I studied Mandarin for many years. So it was a new life. And when you take on a new life, when you leave the old, it requires faith. That's where it's the greatest training in faith. 
And of course, you know, we see that with the disciples. Jesus said, leave your nets, follow me, right? I mean, leaving your nets means that's all they knew how to do up to that point. And now Jesus is telling them, follow me. To do what? They have no clue. Just as Moses had no clue when he stepped into the wilderness. Just as Abraham had no clue when he left Haran and went into the wilderness. And to make matters worse, in Genesis 17, God changed Abraham's name from Abraham to Abraham. I mean, that alone, God was telling him, hey, I'm not only going to change your whole world, I'm going to change your name, your whole character, your whole identity. I'm changing it. Wow. A new life. Can be scary, but you know what? It's the greatest adventure in the world. Because God is taking you. Most Christians must first must see first before they decide whether to obey. You know, we, we, are, we are material people living in a materialistic world. Faith obeys first and sees the results later. So leaving is so important. Stepping out is a faith effort that says, God, I trust you. I don't see it, but I engage faith first. And then when you engage faith, then you begin to see Leaving is letting go. Letting go of some things that can be the toughest things, can be the toughest thing to do it for many of us. So even as you talk about leaving, the leaving part is important because it's what happens in a journey that matters. Many people think that, well, before I leave, let me educate myself. Let me train myself. Let me save up. Let me, you know, uh, save enough to have fine finances so that I don't need to worry. You know, you know that's, that's not the life of faith. The life of faith is if God tells you, leave, trust me, that's what begins to happen in that journey. The training, the development, the resource release from God, that's when it happens. By faith, the Bible says they passed through the Red Sea. The day, first day they left, they didn't even realize, we're going to march right up to Mountains on the side, the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army around us. I mean, like, they didn't even consider that. They couldn't see it. If not, they wouldn't have even left. And that's where God tells us, just step out first. So it's what happens in the journey that as you step out, then you encounter obstacles, you face challenges, you face defeats, you rise up, and you see the hand of God take care of the situation. There are obstacles that need to be overcome that makes living challenging. There will always be obstacles. The life of faith is the life that faces, you know, that, that encounters uh, oceans, uh, mountains, foreign armies, enemies of the faith. And God will show us that, you know, the life of faith is the life that overcomes obstacles. If God doesn't remove the obstacle, God will take us through it. If God doesn't remove the obstacle, God will build us to be strong enough to take it on. And so when you step into the, light, into the faith journey, he will ask you to do the impossible. He will ask you to do the impossible. And, and if you dare believe that God has called you to do the impossible, then he will give you the strength. He will show you the way to do the impossible. That's faith. And this last nine months, man, has been the greatest challenge of stepping and trusting God. And God has seen me through it. The second aspect from leaving is moving into the life that calls you, which I'm entitling living. You need to be living the life of faith. Not just leaving the past and say, now I'm, I'm set free. Now I'm a Christian. I can sit back. No, 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 no. You're still in the wilderness. And so you got to be begin to live the life that God has called you. I like what, you know, Leonard Ravenhill, he's one of my favorite um, authors. That's a book that I read many, many times, and it's about why revival tarries. And Leonard Ravenhill, who's gone back to the Lord, he says, smart men walked on the moon, daring men walked on the ocean floor, but wise men walked with God. I want to be a wise man, you know. I want to be a wise man because uh, when you walk with God, you can never lose. You can only grow stronger and stronger. You can only experience victory. So living is learning. Destiny is dependent on your development. 
It's not just dependent on leaving and then just saying, okay, now I've left sin. I've left my old life. I am born again. I'm saved. No, you are just, you know, halfway through the journey. You're just starting out. So begin to live. Uh, develop a God-ordained walk. Living is walking with God. In the Bible, it says, um, Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. It's not that he just uh, went for walks every day. It's not just that he walked with God and, and, and enjoyed one aspect, but it's a total, holistic, complete uh, lifestyle that, God, that um, the Bible is describing when it says Enoch walked with God. Noah was walking with God when the rest... So I would challenge you to develop a God-ordained walk, not just walking, doing your own thing, not just going through life, living the comfortable life or living the American dream or living, you know, whatever dream you have, but the God-ordained walk. What has God called you? You know, God does not call all of us to, to, to be the richest, to be the most powerful, to be a preacher, even by a, a, a full-time pastor. But God has ordained a walk for each one of us, and we need to walk in it. Noah was walking with God when the rest of the world was not. And that's important. Just because everyone else is doing it, just because everyone else is living that way, doesn't mean that you live that way too. That's not for us. And if you look at Noah's example, and of course, when you listen to what Jesus said, that in the end times, it will be like the days of Noah. In other words, everybody will be doing it. Everybody will be living that way, but not us, the children of God. And so, what's the God of the walk that God calls you? Walking with God means being on the same page. The same page with God, not the same page as the world. Walking with God means maintaining the same pace, not just on the same page, but the same pace with God. Some people say, well, you know, there's, God leaves it to us to pace ourselves. No, God has a pace. When they were going through the wilderness, it was not their timing. It was not their pace. When, when the cloud moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped. God has a pace. God knows exactly, you know, your capability. He knows how much you can handle, and He will pace you. You know, there are many people who, who I've come across with that, that when they get um, born again and some of the spirit field, they, they become so gung-ho, they run with all their strength and, and, and they, they don't allow God to pace them. They think that, that God wants them to run until they drop, and that's not the case. God has a pace. So you need to be on the same page, but at the same pace with God. And that involves training, right? I mean, if you want to pay somebody, you know, you need to be able to, 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 to know their pace and exactly keep up with them. Uh, walking with God is not a sign of perfection. It is living to please God. It's not so that you can be perfect, because none of us can be perfect, but we can please God. And that's the most important thing. How do you please God? Faith. You know, how do you have faith? Listen to God. Faith comes by hearing. Right? How do you please God? Listen to God, obey Him, and keep in step with Him. Then, of course, there's the overcoming of life's challenges because when you're living the life of faith, there will be obstacles that I mentioned earlier. But God promises us that He will take us through it, whether the storms or the mountains or the enemies of faith. It's not how strong you are is how much you overcome despite your apparent weakness that matters. I think this is the lesson of faith that all of us need to learn again and again. This season, I mean, has been a glorious season. The testimony is powerful. But I want you to know that I didn't overcome this cancer journey or the near-death experience because I'm strong, because I was able to do it by myself because of my own prowess or my righteousness, far from it. It was because of God's grace. It was because of God's miracle. It was because of God's people. And this is important, that when you're living, after you have left Egypt, you live as you walk in step with God. You live as you walk in step with the people of God. And that's important. That's why I keep challenging people. You have to be 
part of a local church. You have to get involved. There's no such thing as a solo Lone Ranger Christian. You cannot handle it. You're not going to be able to overcome life challenges. You are not strong enough to do it. And that's why when you read that, that they quench the violence of fire, they escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong, becoming valiant in battle, turned to, fight, to flight the armies of the aliens. Out of weakness, they were made strong. The truth is that we are too weak. But the fact is that God is able to put his strength and his strength in us, working through us, can overcome challenges. So it's not about developing muscles. Seriously. You know, if somebody told you, well, it's about, yeah, you get, get to be this strong Christian. You stand alone. You don't need anybody. You just, you know, do all this stuff. You pray six hours a day, fast two times a week, and, and you go it alone. You can handle it. No. It's got nothing... It's not about becoming so strong that you are a standout. You are this great big hero like Samson that doesn't need anybody. It's about expanding our heart capacity. At the end of the day, it's about the heart. The heart of faith is a heart after God. Because without the heart after God, let me say this, I don't care how strong, even as strong as Samson he fell, even as, as, as you know, and that's where the only one who who did so much exploits, was a man of the God's heart, David. And even then, he fell in a moment of weakness when he forgot that he needed God in his life. So, see, living is not mere existence. Living this life is not so that, you know, I just want to get through, I'll just have my family and, 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 and have a simple life, a quiet life and a happy life. And then, you know, I'll die and go to heaven. It's not just mere existence. There's, there's more to it. If you're just existing, let me say this, there's more to it. You know, shake yourself out of this stupor. There's more to your life. You were not just put on planet Earth so that you are a number, an SIN number, or you live and have kids. You are put here for a purpose. Alan Redpath, he said, a throne is God's purpose for you. A cross is God's path for you. Faith it's God's plan for you. You see, we're, we, we are living, not for ourselves, we are living to serve God's purpose, not even our own purpose. I like what they wrote about David in, in Acts 13. It says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation. Are we serving God's purpose in our generation? Am I serving God's purpose in my generation? Because if I'm not, then I'm wasting my life, I'm wasting God's resources, I stand before God one day, and I'll be judged. You see, in New Living Translation, it says, David had done the will of God, the purpose of God. In the NLV, it says, he did what God wanted. I, again, Rick Warren put it a different way. God's purpose is greater than our problems, greater than our pain, even our sin. Without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Let me put it this way. God has a purpose for your life. And then, of course, living and, and leaving behind a testimony. God calls us to live the life of faith because when you live the life of faith, what you leave behind will always be a powerful testimony. Hebrews 11 Verse 39 says, And all these, who are all these, the heroes, having obtained a good testimony through faith. Let me say this. You cannot get a good testimony without faith. You know, if you try to do it in your own strength, let me say this, you will fall flat on your face and the enemy will be laughing. But if you walk by faith, if you do what God tells you to do, Keep pace with him. Fulfill your purpose. Guess what? Everywhere you go, every person you encounter, you will leave behind a testimony. People will talk behind your back, not about bad things. They will talk behind your back after you have moved on and say, wow, the guy has a powerful testimony. Wow, the guy's life challenged me. This last nine months, 
My faith journey and my battle with cancer has become a good testimony that's shared in different parts of the world. Since Thanksgiving service, the YouTube video has been watched, you know, about, I think, close to 500 times now. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in being a celebrity. I'm not interested in being known even by people. But I'm interested that God gets the glory. I'm, I'm, I'm totally for it that people can hear my, my story of pain and suffering and, and hopeless situation and that God stepped in and God did a miracle and that God can do it for them. That's what a testimony is. But it can't be done without faith. So I praise God for that. And then finally, you got to leave your past, sin. you got to li- start living for God, but then you got to start, even as you live for God, you got to look beyond. Because we're not going to be here forever. And as you are living for God, let me say this, it's not exactly the, the simplest thing on planet Earth if you are living for God. Because there will be trials, there will be problems, there will be storms. Living by faith means waiting on God to keep His promises. Tony Evans, in, 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 in his sermon about Moses, he said, when you look to heaven, you live better on earth. When you look to heaven, you live better on earth. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in the foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, as with him in the same promise. Talking about Abraham. You see, when you live in tents, and living in tents will make one year for a permanent home. And they're not just talking about tents, material, but we're talking about this body, tents. You see, when you encounter pain, when you start aging and your hair starts changing color and you start losing hair and losing teeth and, and losing appetite and losing health and losing that zest for life, what, where do you look for? Many people look behind, right? And, and, and it's, let me put it this way. It's a total waste of time and it only depresses you if you begin to look behind. It says, I wish I was 17 years ago, uh, again. I wish I was 30 years old again because when I was 30, I could do this and that. I wish I was here and there and look back. Let me put it this way. You you can redeem that, but if you look forward and beyond and upward, it can bring you hope. Because when you're looking upward and toward God, to your permanent home, then you realize that, yes, my body may be broken. Yes, my health may not be the same. You know, everything is, is, is starting to break down. But you know what? I'm looking to you, God, because when I see you, when, when, when you come for me or when I die and go into your presence, I will be brand new again. I'll be better than when I was 17, 20, 30. I'll be perfect. And that's where God says, look beyond. Look to the reward. Looking, looking to God when life is too short, because life is too short. I don't care how long you live. Even to 100, it's too short. And waiting is hard. Because the longer you wait, you know, the more of the good stuff you leave behind you. Uh, you get older, and time is not on our side. And then, of course, looking to God when life is too painful. When life is too painful. And this way, God allows pain and suffering. It's His mercy. Because if life was just too good, many of us, We'll just live our lives the way we want, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and we will never ever have to sit down and consider eternity. But God is merciful, and He allows pain and suffering, so that in those moments of pain and suffering, when you can't get out of bed, when you realize that, oh man, you know, it's, I'm, 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 I'm so vulnerable, then we realize, I need something more than this physical, this material world that I'm stuck in. So living by faith means never taking your eyes off heaven. In Hebrews 11.10, says, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He's looking forward. Paul looked forward. He says, forget what lies behind, pressing on forward. Are you looking forward to, to that? You see, I'm looking forward because I know that I have pleased God. I know I have obeyed God for a lot of things that he's asked me to do the past 40, 50 years of my life, ever since I started serving Him. And so, I look forward to when I see Him. 
The people who don't look forward to seeing God perhaps are those who didn't do much and they're worried. What if the master comes tomorrow? What if I die and I go to see him? And that's where I hear a lot of that from people who are about to die. They're like, I regret, I regret not spending enough time serving God. I regret not giving enough to God because they realize I'm going to see God. And they, they, they're kind of like not really looking forward. But we should be looking forward because it's the best day ever. It's the best thing that can happen to us. Living by faith means never taking your eyes off heaven, always looking towards this God. If you're willing to follow Jesus, if you're willing to live the life of faith, to leave behind all those other things, I can promise you that you'll never be disappointed with Him. And your life will never be boring. It will just be full of adventures, you know, it may be nerve-wracking, but it is the greatest joy and the greatest reward in the world. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, Lord, that all these great men and women of God, they are witnesses right now. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and they're cheering us on like in a great race, and they're saying, run, run, run with all your strength. And so, Lord, I run. And I pray that you also raise up every single one of the members of this church, everyone that's listening to this sermon, that, that they will ri rise up and they will run together with me as we run together toward the goal of the high calling of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.